the merging of the living entities <coughs> along with his conditional living tendency with the mystic lying down of Mahavishnu is called the winding up of the cosmic manifestation. Liberation is the permanent situation of the form of the living entity after he gives up the changeable gross and subtle material bodies. As we have discussed several times, there are two types of living entities. Most of them are ever liberated, or nitya muktas, while some of them are ever conditioned. The ever conditioned souls are apt to develop a mentality of lording over the material nature. And therefore the material cosmic creation is manifested to give the ever conditioned souls two kinds of facilities. One facility is that the conditioned soul can act out according to its tendency to lord it over the cosmic manifestation. And the other facility gives the conditioned soul a chance to come back to Godhead. So after winding up of the cosmic manifestation, most of the conditioned souls merge into the existence of the Mahavishnu personality of Godhead, lying in his mystic slumber to be created again in the next creation. But some of the conditioned souls who follow the transcendental sound in the form of Vedic literatures, who follow the transcendental sound in the form of Vedic literatures and are thus able to go back to Godhead, attain spiritual and original bodies after quitting the conditional gross and subtle material bodies. The material conditional bodies develop out of the living entities forgetfulness of their relationship with God, head. And during the course of the cosmic manifestation, the conditioned souls are given a chance to revive the original status of life with the help of revealed scriptures. So mercifully compiled by the Lord in his different incarnations. Reading or hearing of such transcendental literatures helps one become liberated even in the conditional state of material existence. All the Vedic literatures aim at devotional service to the personality of Godhead and as soon as one is fixed, up, fixed upon this point, he at once becomes liberated from conditional life. <clears throat> The material gross and subtle forms are simply due to the conditioned soul's ignorance and as soon as he is fixed in the devotional service of the Lord, he becomes eligible to be freed from the conditioned state. This devotional service is transcendental attraction for the Supreme on account of his being the source of all pleasing humors. Everyone is after some pleasure of humor for enjoyment, but does not know that the supreme source of all attraction, rasovaisa rasam hi evayam labdhvanadi bhavati. The Vedic hymns inform everyone about the supreme source of all pleasure. The unlimited fountainhead of all pleasure is the supreme personality of Godhead. And one who is fortunate enough to get this information through transcendental literatures like Srimad Bhagavatam becomes permanently liberated to occupy his proper place in the kingdom of God. Jai Om Jnana Timananda Shah Gnanjana Salakaya Chakshus Un Militam Nina Taismai Sri Gurve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manovistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Upagadamayam Dadanti Swabhadanti Kam Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Garadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So the verse again, I hope uh, can everyone hear me? Maybe you could get some feedback just to make sure I didn't lose you. You sound great. Okay, thank you Prabhu.
So translation again. The merging of the living entity along with this conditional living tendency with the mystic lying down of Mahavishnu is called the winding up of the cosmic manifestation. Liberation is the permanent situation of the form of the living entity after he gives up the changeable gross and subtle material bodies. So here we're, we're studying these two aspects here, which is Naroda, the winding up of the cosmic manifestation, and Mukti, liberation. And then next time you're going to, I guess tomorrow you're going to hit the summum bonum, which is all these nine actually are, they actually support this summum bonum, which is the source, the shelter of everything, which is Krishna. So, and this is all dealt with throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam. Like these ten subject matters, you can't really say that they're like in the different uh, the first canons, the first one and the second canon, the second one. No, but it's they're actually throughout the entire Bhagavatam. They're different aspects, like all of them are practically everywhere. So, I mean, some of the acharyas have noted that certain cantos describe like the shelter of Krishna and different ones like that, the different ten items or subject matters of the Srimad Bhagavatam can be found in, you know, definitely found in certain parts, but it's actually everywhere. And in fact, everything is everywhere talks about Krishna, the Supreme Person out there, got it. The sum and bonum of everything, which uh, we were very pleased to see that the Srimad Bhagavatam is doing that for all of us so that we can understand him. So going on here, Let's see if we could uh, change this. There we go. So here, talking about the understanding the mystery of the universe, and we can see by some of the illustrations here given us by the Iskand artist and under the guidance of Srila Prabhupada to give us these windows into the spiritual world and actually windows to understand where we are and to see our position in the mature world. So as you can see, we're only... We're covering a small portion of this whole spiritual existence. The material sky is created, as we read in this purport, to accommodate the rebellious jivas, or the spirit souls. And what do they do? They desire to enjoy separately from God. So the material nature allows these souls to suffer and enjoy materially, and also to be reformed. So we can see there's a spiritual world, and the Vaikuntha planets, and just a small section of that we can see there on the bottom right is the material manifestation. In the Bhagavad Gita it mentions uh, how that the material world is created at certain intervals and then again destroyed. So this destruction we're understanding here in this one particular verse is the winding up of all the material nature that all the living entities they, they have merged back into the body of Mahavishnu but they merge with all their tendencies these uh, conditioned living tendencies are merged in with Mahavishnu, so therefore they have to come out again. It's not like because you merge into Mahavishnu, you're liberated. No, this is not liberation. This is just winding up of the cosmic manifestation. So because of these, Prabhupada says, eternally conditioned souls, they have a sense of this ahankara, this false ego, which dictates to them that you know, they want to enjoy the senses. But they don't understand that they have spiritual senses and these material senses is actually inferior. And that we are actually not the enjoyer. Actually, the Lord is the only enjoyer. But because we're forgetful, because we're in ignorance of our constitutional position, then we have these strong aspirations to try to enjoy this material manifestation. And this is a chance we have. This is the the purpose of the entire creation. And also to understand our constitutional position and get out of here. So, as Prabhupada says, if the, for, the fortunate living entities who can catch this truth and they surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then, you know, they can actually become liberated and they're allowed to enter into the kingdom of Godhead. So, this is... Uh, great understanding and how this Mahatattva is assembled and all these different things are described here and it's just 
simply amazing. It's beyond our conception. So we can see here, simply by the glance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, all the rebellious jivas are placed into the womb of Mother Nature. And they're being handed over for under her shelter. And so she, what she does, what does she do? She awards them material bodies in various shapes according to their activities and desires. And we'll talk about that a little more later. So for the purpose of creation of the innumerable material universes, so that they, these souls can inhabit them, Lord Krishna expands himself as Mahavishnu. And he lies down in this Kaji ocean, and from his pores of his skin, all the universes emanate. So they do at his exhalation. And again, they enter into his body at inhalation. So just see, all this happens to just the breathing of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Inconceivable. And here, Lord Krishna, he further expands himself to enter all the material universes resting on his serpent carrier, Anantasesha, on the water within the universes. And then his expansion, again, from there, is Garbhodaksai Vishnu. And from his navel sprouts a lotus that is the birthplace of the firstborn jiva. That's Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma is empowered by the Supreme Lord. This is the second aspect where he, Krishna expand, creates all the material ingredients of the first subject matter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and then the sub-creation is done by Lord Brahma. He's empowered by the Supreme Lord to carry out his desire of creating all the different species of life and uh, in all their different environments. What power he has. And now, of Krishna's causes mercy, the Lord in his super soul feature, he takes residence in all the hearts of the living beings. And then he gives them guidance in all affairs. So not only human beings, but you can see animals and demigods. This is Krishna's mercy. He's everywhere in his super soul feature, guiding us. Just see what a friend he is. Even though we want to become like him or enjoy separately from him, still he's with us to guide us, to fulfill our desires in the mature world and guiding us for that. And also looking for that one moment, that one time they just turn towards him and then he will help them with that desire to come back to him. So the jivas, they're, they're controlled in this material world by these qualities of material nature, which in, control, which in turn they're controlled by Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu. These are the agents of the Lord. So we can see here the jivas are controlled by the qualities of material nature, which are in turn, they're controlled by the Lord's agents, which are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. So Krishna is kind, and he incarnates in various transcendental forms just to attract us back to Godhead, just to attract all the fallen conditioned souls back to him, and thus release us from this grip of material nature. So it's so kind. And here you can see he incarnates in uh, ten major forms that we study throughout the Bhagavatam and other forms that just out of his mercy to reclaim us back to Godhead. So he displays himself in very attractive features. This is one of the aspects of the ten items of the Srimad Bhagavatam is this Krishna's pastimes are described, which are there to, dis to attract us. He is the hero. We're all attracted to heroes in the material world. You know, but here, Krishna is a supreme hero. The heroes today are just phonies, actually. Just, they're a hero on the screen. They look very majestic and beautiful and powerful, but yet 
you look in their normal lives, they're just like debauchees practically. And then after 20, 30 years, they're old and wrinkled, bald. But yet they think they can hang on to it by wearing wigs or trying to do some lifts or whatever. But it's just silly. They look like clowns. But look at Krishna. It's the last time he had pastimes here was 5,000 years ago, and yet he's still youthful, still very beautiful. This is Krishna. So here, we're like in an ocean of material nature, and it's casting all the living entities into various situations. So we see the soul transmigrates from one type of body to another based on our mentality for enjoyment. Because our material body, the living entity in that material body, he forgets his actual spiritual identity. What is that? As a part and parcel of Krishna. So he becomes covered by the mode of ignorance. And the living entity, he will sometimes think, oh, I'm a male. I'm a female. I'm a human. I'm an animal. I'm a demigod, and so on. As you can see, it's described here in this ocean. So, if the living entity has desires that are in the different modes of material nature, like if his desires are in, in primarily in the mode of goodness, then he's promoted to higher planetary systems. So we can see demigod bodies on the top right. And if in passion, then we remain in the middle system, as like human beings. And if he's in ignorance, then he's pushed down into the lower species of life, as we can see there. And to counteract all this distressful condition, of these material bodies, one has to get out of this. That's the way to get out, <laughs> to actually get out of here and go back to Godhead. And there's a way. And this is why Ashita Prophet has come to give us this knowledge. He's a representative of Krishna. The pure devotees, they're actually liberated souls. We'll discuss how they're liberated. And they come within the material world, supposedly with material bodies. And supposedly we think they have a subtle body, but do they? Do they really? We'll discuss that. So we can see, Sri Prabhupada has created this ISKCON boat, ISKCON ship, you know, to go over this vast ocean of material existence, which is just full of miseries, suffering, the influences of material nature, and the influences of the age of Kali. So just try to understand the difference between the living man and the dead body. The dead body means that as soon as that living force, that spark, is gone, then it's dead matter, it's useless. So as long as that living force is in this material body, then there can be some life. It's due to that living force. So just like there's dead matter and there's living force, so similarly, there's also a material world and a spiritual world. And we all belong to that spiritual world. We don't belong to this material world. But somehow or another, we discuss a little how we came in contact with this material world. And then we have this material body. So that's the business now, is that we are an eternal living force. And in, because we're in contact with this material body, we have to take four tribulations. And what is that? We can see it here, birth, death, disease, and old age. So, just like anything in material, if you take an example like the dress, you know, if you're dressed in a certain garment, and then when it's worn out, it's not usable anymore, you throw it away, you get another dress. So the material body is like that. It's a dress for the spiritual living force. And because we're attached to this material world, we want to try to enjoy here as much as we can. We get all these different types of bodies. And they're described to be in the Bhagavad Gita as a machine. There's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam, Hridesha Arjuna Tishtati, Ramayan Sarva Bhutani, Yatra Rudani Mayaya. So that man proposes, God disposes. He's very kind. Whatever you desire, he'll fulfill. But he knows, even though he says, 
that this kind of material desires will not satisfy you, but we said we were so stubborn that we want it, therefore God supplies it to us. So this is how kind he is. Just to fulfill our desires, he gives us different conditional bodies. And these bodies change according to our desires. This is called the evolutionary process. So by this evolution, we may go through many millions of bodies. There's a verse from the Padma Purana, Jalaja Nava Lakshani Stavara Laksha Vim Sati that we pass through 900,000 species of forms in the water, 2 million forms as plants, trees. So in this way, it's by nature's way, he brings us into this different human form of life. Just to develop, awaken our consciousness. Nature gives us a chance. Now what do you want to do? Now you've got this developed consciousness. Now again, do you want to go through the evolutionary process? Or do you want to go to the higher planetary systems? Or you want to go back to God, back to Krishna. Or you can remain here. Your options are there. So that's how we are. We're just like we're in this machine. Yanti Deva Vrata Devan Pitrin Yanti Pitrin Vrata. Buteja Yanti Bhutani Mad Yajino Pi Yanti Mam. So we can make our selection. You can go from the higher planetary systems. You can go down to the middle planetary systems. Wherever you want to go, you can go. So we have that option in the human form of life. But what is, the, what is the spiritual world? We mentioned a little bit about that. Where we go, there's no material comparison. Everything's spiritual. Even the plants, the trees, everything is there. So Prabhupada comes to describe that. And that's what he's saying. That's our movement. We're saying, why not stop this material condition of life of repeated birth and death, old age and disease? That's intelligence. Why do you want to remain in this material body and undergo a repetition of change of body? Let's have our spiritual body back. <laughs> that's what we want. And that's what human life is actually meant for. That's one of the main things. It's described in the Vedanta, Tato Brahma Jignasha. Now that you have this life, you must inquire about the absolute truth. That's human intelligence. But we can spoil our life just like the animals. You know, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, desiring these things. So this is our Krishna consciousness movement. We're trying to educate people about this science of how to go back home, back to Godhead. It's actually a science. And how is it? Simply chanting this Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And for those big scientists, big brains, we have got all these many books, over 80 volumes of books, I think, now. And, you know, these are just meant to convince you. You have a scientific brain, and you can be convinced. Otherwise, just chant Hare Krishna. And this is the cleansing process. Chaito Dharpana Marjanam. By this cleansing process, the core of the heart becomes pure. Because now it's covered with so many dirty things. But if we chant then it becomes cleansed. And then we'll be able to see, what am I? What's my position? What's my goal of life? What do I have to do? So the human being, he can very nicely understand these things because he has that higher consciousness. So here we have the Atma. What actually are you? What is the form of the self? So we have these gross bodies. We can see represented by the robot or the machine, which we've discussed, Bhagavad Gita described as bodies like a machine. And then there's a subtle body, which is also material. And both these bodies are always changing. Conditioned by material nature, we change. So originally we were a pure spiritual soul in the spiritual world, and we became conditioned by material nature. We became conditioned by desire is to enjoy separately from Krishna. So what happens to the spiritual body in the spiritual world? It actually shrinks down to a speck, a spiritual spark. And then that spiritual spark, it gives its consciousness to the subtle body, which is made up of mind, intelligence, and false ego. And according to that subtle body, 
which is you know made of the mind, intelligence, false ego, we get a gross body. So they both change. Just like the gross body changes from the embryo to childhood, we saw how it changes, and then eventually it dies. So that's death. That means the soul leaving the gross body, but the subtle body is still there. It doesn't die. And that subtle body carries the soul to the next body according to its shape. So that's interesting. The subtle body gets its shape. How does it get its shape? It's according to the activities of the gross body. So therefore, we have to be very careful how we act. Because however you act, they leave impressions, imprints on your subtle body. If you act like an angel, you'll get an angel body. If you act like a pig, you get a pig body. If you act like a dog, you get a dog's body. If you act like a devotee, you start to develop a spiritual body. So, just like we can see when you act, say you do something wrong, how do you feel? Maybe nobody even saw you, but how do you feel when you do something wrong? I mean, you know you did something wrong. You feel guilty, yeah, but then you feel heavy, right? You feel heavy like a machine. You feel like iron. You feel material. But when you do something right, and you feel good. But you also feel very light. You feel blissful. Just like there was a devotee who took initiation here, and I asked, well, how, how do you feel? How does it feel to get initiated? She goes, oh, I feel so light. So this is a spiritual activity. It makes you light. And material activity makes you heavy. Because you're acting in such a way that you're molding your subtle body in such a way that it's, going to, it's being attracted to these heavy, sinful, gross bodies. So how do we get rid of this subtle body? I mean, death, you get rid of the material body. But the subtle body doesn't die. Hare Krishna. I don't know where that we got a little uh, musical there that's something from Skype maybe you want to uh, log out of Skype oh maybe that is true yeah that's sorry it is me sorry about that yeah maybe I should log out of there real quick here let's see what we got here if I could get out that's what that is let me find Skype yeah I thought I had closed it down but I must have hit the wrong thing Okay, sorry for the interruption there. Let's hit play. I didn't lose you, did I? Hello? Yeah, everything is fine. Okay, good. So uh, we're understanding. We want to figure out how we want to get rid of this subtle body. So we have to purify it. How do we purify the mind? It's described in the Bhagavad Gita. Manmana bhava mad bhakto that we have to think of Krishna. And then the mind becomes spiritualized. So this is also then, there's the mind, intelligence, and ego. So how does intelligence become purified? It's described in the Bhagavad Gita, Tesham Satata Yuktanam. By Satata Yuktanam, always engaged in Bhajatam Priti Purukam, engaged in rendering devotional service with love to Krishna. And then our intelligence Krishna says, I'll give you the intelligence by which you can come to me. This is the Buddha Yoga. It's intelligence. And what is intelligence? We're given the intelligence on how to act properly. It's action in Krishna consciousness. That's what Buddha Yoga is. Action in Krishna consciousness. So we're learning how to act with the gross body so that the subtle body can be molded so that it will guide us. So this is the process. And uh, the living entity, then when there's no false ego, then what is it? We have our original what? Jiva Swarupa Hai Krishna Nitya Das. We're in our eternal relationship with Krishna. 
We are eternal relationship with Krishna as a servant. That's our constitutional position, is an eternal servant of Krishna. So this is very nice about how, you know, we have these gross bodies, we have these subtle bodies, but we are trying in Krishna consciousness to get rid of the subtle body. And that's what is called mukti. So when you spiritualize the subtle body, then it's transformed into your spiritual body again, again gets to get manifested. Just like because we stopped serving Krishna, we lost our spiritual senses, so to speak, our limbs, and we shrunk into a tiny spark. But then when you engage in spiritual activities with your gross material body, you know, you're, you want to take prasadam, you know, you need a, a mouth. So your spiritual mouth starts to take place. First of all, it starts with chanting Hare Krishna, as we mentioned. And then in order to do that, you need your spiritual tongue. The tongue begins to manifest. And then we develop these different senses are developing. And then the more and more we develop this spiritual body, then what happens is that the subtle body actually is transformed. It's no more, actually. We are in, awakened our spiritual bodies within that material body. So that's amazing. How does that happen? So we're, just by engaging, you know, chanting Hare Krishna, we need the tongue, taste prasadam, we need a mouth, etc. So then the full spiritual body becomes manifest through rendering devotional service. So just see, by engaging the gross body in devotional service, that subtle body will develop according to our original spiritual body. That's amazing. Because we can see here, real liberation doesn't mean that we just become free from material bondage. We're all bound. So one may think that, okay, so I just have to escape this prison. And so someone may dig a tunnel and think that if I just get out of this prison, I'll be free. And then one inmate would say, what does he do? He obeys the king. He's put in prison by the king because he was disobedient to the king's orders. So then what does he do in prison? He starts to follow the orders of the king. And then the ones that are watching over him, they begin to report to the king that he is now following you and is engaged in your service. So the king eventually will say, okay, he's acting very nicely, then is given the key on, and to just get out of the prison. And once he's out of the prison, what does he do? He serves the king. It's not that he goes to the palace and he becomes the king. It's not that the living entity, the jiva, can become God. He remains eternally a servant of Krishna. So this is the process to become pure. And how does that material body, even though we are engaged, say that this is the position of the pure devotee, he's awakened a spiritual body within the, in the gross body. But supposedly that gross body, it looks material, but it's not. It's actually a spiritual body. And how is that described? Just as it's described how hot iron, when it becomes red hot, it's no longer iron. It's actually like fire. It acts like fire. It becomes fire, practically. So this is the process of how we purify the subtle body and then the gross body becomes so pure, it's transformed into its spiritual body, and then you can become liberated. This is what Bhakti Yoga does. Jaryati asu ya kosham nagirnam analo yata. Bhakti, devotional service, dissolves the subtle body of the identity without separate endeavor or separate effort, just as fire in the stomach digests all that we eat. So this is bhakti, it's higher position than mukti. This is what real mukti is, is devotional service to Krishna. Is that position where we attain our original constitutional position. And how is that? Simply through that tongue of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we can see this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is actually... It it's actually comes from Goloka. We can see here the Hare Krishna mantra 
is coming down from Goloka Vrindavan, Goloka Premadan. It's coming down, and we can see that as it's going down through all the different layers of the material and spiritual manifestations. We can see that here, the supreme transcendental sound vibration is coming, and it comes into this material world right where we are here. This is our process to become liberated. So this is very interesting of how, oh, uh, something came up. I'm going to be right back. Maybe you could just observe this and see how that Hare Krishna mantra has penetrated, and I'll be right back. Hold on. Take a break there. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Reminds me of uh, Guru Swami was giving class and there was an emergency that came up in class too and he told everybody to chant Hare Krishna and how we become empowered by chanting Hare Krishna and how Prabhupada said that the devotees wanted to ask Prabhupada how they could become empowered to distribute his books or to become empowered like that and he said that you want to become empowered? I think Prabhupada asked like three times. And they said, yeah. And then they said, you, when you chant Hare Krishna, you sit down in one sitting and chant all your rounds at once. That's how you become empowered. So there's many devotees that do that. I know several devotees here that do that. And uh, you can see that they're actually empowered. And they've been distributing books for many, many years and preaching Krishna consciousness throughout the world. So this is great. Um, Simply by chanting Hare Krishna, you know, it's, we can go beyond this samsara, get relief from this uncomfortable position in the material world of anxiety. So we have to take this Hare Krishna mantra and uh, see the practical result. It doesn't really cost anything except our faith. And this is what we will develop. Simply by hearing about Krishna, we are, there's a nice uh, verse quoted in this purport. Prabhupada quotes, Raso vai saha rasami evayam labd vananti bhavati. He who understands the personality of Godhead, the reservoir of pleasure of Krishna, truly becomes transcendentally blissful. So this is what happens when we understand Krishna. We become very blissful. But the process to do that is to hear. So it's very essential that we understand uh, what we're hearing about. And this is what we're hearing is these mellows, this rasa of Krishna, this very attractive nature of Krishna who attracts everyone and everything. Even the incarnations of Krishna, as we showed a glimpse, is that he even incarnates to attract animals and different species back to him. So Krishna is attractive to everyone. So we have to follow the principles of glorifying Krishna so that we can become spiritualized, transform these material gross and subtle bodies, transform them back into our spiritual bodies. So it's very important. And there was a nice uh, thing here how it talks about how our faith, I mentioned that. And uh, there's a nice thing I found here is how it's described that uh, Let's see if I could find it here. So, uh, 
It's about hearing. Oh, here he's saying, it's about, uh, if you can recall, the uh, purpose for Vasu Drona and his wife, Dara, they perform these severe austerities to get Lord Krishna as their son. And they desire to be just totally immersed in the Lord's all attractive childhood pastimes. And so much so that when they heard others, when others heard these pastimes, they would also be transported across the ocean of birth and death. And that's from the uh, Krishna book, the chapter 8. So, while Drona and Dara, they asked Lord Brahma to make it easy for devotees to be delivered from material misery, the couple put forward one stipulation. And what was that? That the devotees would have to believe in the divinity of Krishna and his pastimes. So in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that 10th canto, chapter 8, it describes that they made faith the single prerequisite for devotees desiring to benefit from hearing Krishna's Vrajavila. So this is the, in this way, faith, it's the prerequisite for attaining pure devotion. And it's also the prerequisite for hearing about Krishna's pastimes. So that's very important. We have to we just have this faith in the beginning that simply hearing about Krishna, we will gain everything. We will gain our original status. And we will enjoy with these transcendental mallows with Krishna. They're, not, they're beyond material mallows that we experience just with our tongue, with the senses, the material sense objects, or that we experience between relationships that we have with other people. It's far beyond those because these are material and they're temporary. But there's an eternal taste, eternal rasa with Krishna that it gets ever increasingly blissful in many different you know, aspects, different features. It's just amazing how we can experience this. And this is what we're missing. This is what we're looking for. So because this is the December month, this is the month where we ch- celebrate the, as they say, Gita Jayanti, the advent of the Bhagavad Gita. We just celebrated that this Sunday. We did a fire jogya. We chanted the entire Bhagavad Gita. 800 verses, I think it is. And uh, for every time we chanted it, we did swaha, we put ghee in the fire. So it took about four, over four hours. And we did that so that, uh, you know, we could honor this transcendental messages coming from Krishna to display himself in his activities with his devotees like Arjuna and to give us the science of self-realization to understand that we are a spiritual spark completely apart from this material and gross body and how we can transform and how take advantage of this chance of this material manifestation to actually develop this mukti, this liberation. So thank you very much. May I can open up for any questions or realizations. I've already unmuted everyone. Okay. Go to G. <clears throat> Wonderful class, Prabhuji. Um, you know, you said something I had never thought about before. And um, it was, I don't know, it was, I found it profound. I guess others have thought about it, but I, it, all my years, when you, when you mentioned that um, about when at the time of the dissolution, the living entities become wound back up and merge into the Lord, you pointed out that that's not liberation. No. I just never thought about that before. And as I started thinking about it, it made a tremendous amount of sense that just like um, sometimes when we sleep, we go in a very, very deep sleep and we're not conscious. And so the living entities wound back up into the body of Krishna, they're you know, like non-manifest, whereas those in the Brahma Jyoti are conscious. Uh, they're conscious of, of Krishna, not Krishna personally, not Krishna's personality or relationship in that sense, or not even Krishna's form, but the energy from Krishna's body, which is Brahmananda, which is very, very pleasurable. Of course, nothing compared to infinitely more pleasurable than the heavenly planets, but nothing compared to our rasa, and it's not the constitutional position, but it is conscious versus those non-liberated, those being drawn into the body of Krishna. They're 
unconscious at that time. Anyway, that was, um, I don't know, I never thought about that before, but I like that. Uh, another point, this is just kind of sort of point of interest. Can you bring back up the picture of the ship that was, yes, Papa. yeah, this is just a little thing from a sailor's point of view. Uh, this boat, this boat is a square rigger. Oh, there's generally two types of, you know, the most common types of sail. The modern sail is a Marconi. It's like a big triangle. And a Marconi rig can sail into the wind. It can pretty much go in any direction. Uh, not dead into the wind, but uh, except mm -hmm. for 45 degrees, or 90 degrees or so, it, direct, it can't go. But the square rigger only goes one way. It goes down, it goes in one direction. And that it's only going one way. It's going back to Godhead. <laughs> the square rigger can't turn around and go the other way. In fact, the way they circumnavigate the earth is they, oh, they get into the trade winds, which is going in one direction, and they go all the way around the earth. They, so they end up, they, they, never, they never change direction. They're, nice. always going, they're always going from east to west. So oh. they're always going, that ship of Prabhupada's is always going back to the spiritual world. It doesn't turn around and go anywhere else. You could jump off the ship. That's another story. But that ship wow. is only going in, in uh, one direction. Oh, so that's the actual kind of ship it is, that whoever drew that. They must have known that, huh? Uh, I don't know. I, I doubt yeah. it. I think they just took yeah. a real traditional look of a square rigger. Only yeah. if they're a sailor, they're only, only a sailor would know that the square rigger pretty much only goes downwind. You, you can't turn oh. around and go upwind at all. So... This has just gone back to Godhead, one direction. That's cool. Wow, thanks for bringing that up. That's anyway, pretty that's just a little point of interest, yeah. but great class. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, great comments. Any, question, question. Any other questions or realizations? If no one else had anything, um, I did note something here that this is a, a point of interest. In the purport, um, it's, I guess my point is it's very important that we have a, a global understanding of Prabhupada's books because if we read something and focus on it out of context with everything else, it can be misleading. And mm -hmm. that's the sentence where, let's see how far to go here. Uh, okay, it's, it's just down a little ways down from the beginning. I'll read the sentence. Um, but some of the conditioned souls who follow the transcendental sound in the form of Vedic literatures are thus able to go back to Godhead, attain, spir attain spiritual and original bodies after quitting the conditional gross and subtle material bodies. So it, it's the part about attain spiritual and original bodies after quitting the conditional gross and subtle bodies. And in one sense, that's not, it, it's, we have to read that figuratively and not literally because we don't attain spiritual or original bodies. We could say perhaps that we uh, exhibit or, or manifest or, or display our original spiritual bodies. But we always have them. We never lose them. Just like right. the, um, there's that, that Bengali verse, uh, what is it? Anicca Siddha Krishna Prem Shadya Kabo Noi, Shravananda Shita Chitta Kori Odoi. So, Shadya means to, I think it's the same, that Bengali word, I think it's the same as the Sanskrit word, Ladva, is to obtain. So, Shadya Kabo Noi, Kabo, at any time, and Noi not. So we do not at any time uh, obtain Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem. It's awakened, Kodiye Udoi. It's always there. It's covered. Yeah. So anyway, you know, we, we, we never really uh, attain our spiritual bodies. We never lose them. Right. They just, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I was kind of mentioning a little bit about that, how the spiritual body just kind of shrinks because of, you know, and then it manifests itself in these subtle and gross bodies. But it's still there, I mean. So, right. Yeah. 
looked like I was watching uh, Olympic uh, archery. And they have a te teddy bear uh, mascot. See? And then they showed them. It was very hot, so the guy inside was thirsty. They had to open up the mouth of the teddy bear and get to the other guy's mouth, in the actor inside, and and give him some water. And there's a body in there. It doesn't look anything like the teddy bear. Uh. But there's a there's a man in there. Now he's got an external. He's waving to the crowd like the teddy bear, but inside inside he's dehydrating. And Probably dripping wet from the heat, uh -huh. suffering. Now inside that body, there's a soul yeah. body. And there's a soul body. Yeah, mm. that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a covering. So you say the 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 teddy bear is the gross body, the human man in there is the subtle body because he's acting. Yeah, and inside that is the true spiritual body. Yeah. Go to when you show the like slide of the iron. Maybe yeah. bring that up again. The slide, the the, uh, the iron in the fire. Oh, that, I thought you meant the iron body there. No, the I, iron in the, the the little. Yeah, wow. I don't know why when when you talked about that and showed it, it like even though I know this, it just took it to. It just went to like a much deeper level than I've ever experienced before, and I can't wait for the next time I'm giving a Sunday feast talk to talk about how our body, when we use it in the service of Krishna, it becomes spiritualized. I know somehow it, it yeah. just when you when you said it, all these points that we we know them and we hear them, they just get sweeter and sweeter and deeper and deeper. We don't always have to say something new. Yeah, the contrast here really struck me, you know, how this dead, cold steel, you know, compared yeah. to the one that's just glowing with brilliance. And we can actually become like that. So you must have been sitting in one position chanting your 16 rounds because you became <laughs> empowered to take all these things to other levels for us. Well, I'm, I'm that's trying. That's very powerful. That, I don't know that, that visual. I, I guess it's the visual. I don't The visual and your potency. But it really took it to another level how our, our, our material body becomes spiritualized when engaged in the service of Krishna. And, of course, the Sanskrit verse in, in Gita is Brahmarpanam Brahmahavir Brahmagyal Brahmanahutam Brahmaivatina Gantagya Brahmakarma Samadhina that that which is offered into the fire takes all the same qualities of the fire. Mm. Yeah, like Prabhupada says, what, is that iron or is that fire? What is it? Is that what is that? Is that an iron rod or is it fire? <laughs> no, it's it's both. Yeah. No, it comes like fire. But That's it's certainly cool exhibiting all the it's all the qualities of fire are completely manifest in that iron. So that's uh, mm -hmm. a great, I don't know, great, very powerful, very powerful analogy, and it just I don't know, it just took it deeper in my heart. Very nice. Yeah, I thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, I've been. Uh, I think it's very good to, for devotees to practice that. The first thing, first priority is chanting, because that's where you really get in touch with this fire, this flame, of Krishna. And uh, I've been trying that. Sometimes I'll just get up even before, after I brush my teeth, and you know, just start chanting before I even take a shower, and then get that out of the way, and then no distra you know, no distractions, just do it. Mm -hmm. And more and more, I find that uh, that when I do that, it makes a big difference. Because if your mind's not under control, if you're not in touch with Krishna, then you are just open game for Maya. You are going to be distracted. There's nothing that can stop you and your senses from becoming attached to the practice. There's nothing except the holy name. And that's where that power comes from. That's where the devotees can go out there amongst all these materialists, amongst all the distractions, and completely focus on trying to help them bring out their spiritual consciousness and not, you know, get contaminated by their association or the distractions out there. They're doing it for 30, 40 years. And it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's actually proven. These are liberated souls in the material world. That's a pure devotee, even though we see the pure devotee has the material body, 
supposedly as a mind, but the mind, he doesn't have a subtle body. It's the spirit soul acting within that gross body. And the gross body isn't gross anymore. It's actually, it's actually spiritual, like this iron becoming spiritualized. Iron becoming fire. Goda, could you, one, one before you leave us, could you show us one more time at Golokara Pramadan how, the, how the, the sound of the holy name comes from Goloka? You showed oh, it once. Yeah. All, I mean, that was really cool. Yeah. You could show how that. Do you do that? See, if you can see here, it's the, you can see here you've got the Hare Krishna mantra. Yeah, you go a little slower this time. It's really cool. Let me see where it's going. Yeah. See, it comes down through here. So here we're in, uh, this is actually Goloka Vrindavan, where it came from. And then we go to the next slide, which would slide through here. So and then it comes down again. So it's coming from here. It's going through the Vaikuntha Lokas, even going through the Brahma Jyoti. Then it enters into the Karna Ocean. And then it keeps going down and down and then We'll go to the next slide. So then here it comes into this material world, enters the universe, enters one universe, so it's entering all the universes actually, but we just happen to be in this one, and you can see. This is where it enters, right there. Wow, That's where it comes. very cool. Yeah. Very powerful. You can see how this is the manifestation of Krishna is so kind. It's huge manifestation, isn't it? Just for to satisfy our desires. That's how cool Krishna is. I mean, he's really a friend. I mean, just to satisfy you, even though you want to rebel from him, he creates this great phantasmagoria. <laughs> it's actually a virtual reality to think that you're enjoying, but at the same time, it gives you a chance to go back. And that's that link, the Hare Krishna mantra. That's how we get out of here. So that's the most important thing we should be doing is chanting nice rounds, finish our rounds, not distracted rounds throughout the day. So, but you know, just uh, really focusing on Krishna. That's that faith we have to have. That's the requirement to hear and to engage in Krishna's consciousness. So, yeah. Anyway, and other comments or questions? Realizations? Goda, I think of you sometimes when I'm speaking about our parampara and, and how it works and how that I take shiksha um, even from my nephews. And I think of you. Yeah, thank you, Prabhu. And I'm, you're, I'm I'm just, technically, technically your uncle. I always take shiksha from you. Very uh, wise and, and realized and potent words. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. I'm only nourished by your, by your inspiration, by your encouragements, and all the devotees here on Skype or whatever way we're associating. Appreciate it very much. So thank you very much. I guess we can end now. Or does anybody have a question? Yes, yes. Hare Krishna. Well, thank you so much for the class. I'm I'm on Skype, but I'm really looking forward to seeing the slides on YouTube. Oh, okay, yeah. This yeah, afternoon. you got to see it. I don't know if um, it will show the interactive part, but yeah, maybe it will show this, showing you the interactive part. It probably will. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, this has always worried me about why Srila Prabhupada calls some of the living entities ever conditioned. Um, could you explain ever, ever? Because usually conditioned means conditioned to the material world, like it does later in the purport. Mm -hmm. So why are we called ever conditioned? Well, it's, it's kind of like uh, one of those terms in the they use this like forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's like, you know, you know, like, oh, you know, you're always doing something like that. You're always saying this. It's not like I always say that or, you know, you've been you know, being accused of doing something all the time. It's just kind of an expression 
it's not that we're, you know, it's just such a long time that it seems like it's ever conditioned, but it's, you know, it's, you know, it's not, there was a time when we were in the spiritual world, otherwise why would we, you know, say go back home, back to God? But it's like an expression, you see a lot of that in the, in the Vedas, it's described like, you know, forever and ever, or eternally, you know, could it's just another, it's kind of an expression like we use in English, like, you know, you're always doing that. You know what I say? You know what I mean? Something like that. That's how I see it. Is that all right? Well, Srila Prabhupada is so precise on everything else. I it just it's hard for me to understand him using a, a a phrase, a common throwaway phrase in something so important. But anyway, that ever conditioned has just always bothered me. Yeah. No, I think go to go to answer it perfectly. And I agree completely with what he said, um, is that, um, you know, some things that Prabhupada says, he speaks figuratively and sometimes he speaks literally. But by having a global understanding of, of all of Prabhupada's books, we can understand exactly what he's saying. That we've been here so long that you can, we can't trace out the beginning of our sojourn in this material existence. It's just too far back innumerable births, so nitya bandha, e- eternally bound. But we know it doesn't mean, as Goda said, it doesn't, it's, it, it's, it's so long, it's practically e- eternal, it seems like it, but then again, it's also described that when we go back to the spiritual world, it'll, it'll, it's just like a moment, just like we, yeah. <laughs> we, we just drifted off for a moment. There's a, yeah. nothing. When you compare that, that which seems so long here, when you compare it to, to real eternity, then it's like nothing. It's just a, not even a blip. That's true. Thank Prabhupada you. isn't triv- is trivializing by describing it in that way. It's just to help us understand it. It seems like it's eternal. and the, Our brains can only, are only capable of understanding so much so we, to help us understand, it, it's, it's practically like eternal, even though it's, it's just a moment in eternal time. Yeah, you know, Prabhupada's just quoting, he's saying, he's quoting what he's saying too there. And it's like the Vedas, it's like, they say things in such a way to make you think and use your brain, you know, like sometimes there's contradictions and things like that. So it's, it's forcing us to really think deeply about these things mm. so that we can understand properly because there's so much depth and so much to understand just like we were pointing out about it says attain that you know after we hear the sound we attain our spiritual and original mm-hmm. bodies we don't attain them we already have them but we we know yeah but we've saying. lost them for the time being you can say attain it's you're you, you can it's, you're absolutely right you're you, right it's, you're, you're elevating yourself to that plane of spiritual consciousness where you enter into your original state of Satchitananda, you've attained something, you know, or you can wallow in the sewer here. Huh. Yeah. So, so here, uh, one of the first uh, <clears throat> preaching pamphlets uh, that a lot of devotees in early days saw was the Reservoir of Pleasure. And that's one of the themes of the purport. I love the title and, of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Krishna is the source of all pleasure. I mean, uh, it was just a real hook. I mean, everybody wants to be happy. Everyone is seeking pleasure. They're, they're looking for it in the wrong places, but that, that's what they're looking for. So, <laughs> Raso, you know, Vai, Sa, Rasam, you know, he, this is Krishna. Yeah. You know, that's from uh, one of the Upanishads, interestingly enough. And that's quoted so many times. Yeah, Prabhupada likes that. And and yeah. so, and, and also the, the idea of being fixed, uh, nishta, in devotional service, uh, then Prabhupada says in the purport, one becomes eligible to be freed from the conditioned state. You know, just by flipping your senses and mind over to devotional service, you, you, you actually can attain liberation, you know, but you have to do it, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, not coming and going, meaning in an unbroken way. 
Yeah. You don't have to fix your life in such a way that it's always like that. You know, it's very, it's very interesting what you said about we could remain in the sewer. <laughs> that was pretty graphic. There was a, another graphic that I saw that related to this. <laughs> One of the aspects of the prisoner, he thinks that, oh, I'll just dig out of the prison, I'll be free. But they showed like a cartoon of one guy digging underground and then he's going, you know, horizontal and then he's right just inches away from an outhouse and is just about to dig into the pit of the outhouse. <laughs> so this is our direction in the material world, wherever you go, that you're just going to run into these, this sewer. <laughs> anyway, that reminded me of that. Make it more grounded. Right. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I like the cool. images. I, I, I like uh, you, you you putting the effort into a slide presentation. I like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think we all get a lot out of that. Go to that's very powerful. Okay. And and you you don't have to restrict yourself. To, you like this image here. You don't have to restrict yourself to the BBT images. You can you know. Yeah. You can pull stuff off the internet. Also, yeah. and you've done that, and uh, with some effect, you know, uh, effectiveness, and I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, bro. Yeah, it's all become burning rods. Yes. That's what we're yeah. all here together to be in the fire yeah. of the Bhagavatam. Thank you. I could I could feel the fire from you guys. I could feel the radiation. Thank You're you. igniting it. Jai. Thank you, Goda Prabhu. Jai, thank you, Amananda. Thank you, Goda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank